Wave Radio. Texas History Lessons presents an occasional daily dose of Texas history with your host, Michael. In 1874, a group of buffalo hunters, merchants, and hidesmen were camped about a mile from the site of where representatives of the trading firm of Bent St. Vrain and Company had established a trading post in the 1840s. And now this site is in modern Hutchinson County, Texas. But back in the 1840s, the goal was to establish trade with the Comanches and Kiowas who avoided Bent's fort that was on the upper Arkansas River in Colorado. And about 1845 or 1846, William Bent and Saron St. Vrain themselves arrived at the site and brought Mexican adobe makers and had them build Fort Adobe. It was about 80 square feet in size and had nine foot walls and one entrance. This endeavor was not successful, and attempts to trade finally came to an end in 1849 when William Bent lit gunpowder and attempted to destroy the fort, leaving some remains, the adobe walls. The remains became a site known by everyone on the plains, and it was where in November 1864, 10 years before the day we're talking about in this episode, Colonel Kit Carson and about 300 members of the 1st Cavalry of New Mexico Volunteers were resting their horses and recovering after sacking Dohassen's Kiowa Village. Word spread to Comanches in the area, and the Volunteers did not get to rest very long. Dohassen, with Stumbling Bear and Satanta, launched several attacks against Carson and his men, who eventually withdrew to survive what became known as the First Battle of Adobe Walls. Now, ten years later, the encamped buffalo hunters, hide men, and merchants fought what became the Second Battle of Adobe Walls on June 27, 1874. Now, there had been erected a number of log buildings, and they surrounded it with an eight-foot-high corral fence made from cottonwood tree trunks that they'd harvested from nearby creeks. There were two stores, a blacksmith shop, and a saloon. And the purpose of the location was to serve as a place for buffalo hunters who were out on the plains killing buffalo for their hides. It was a place for them to come and sell the hides to be transported to places like Dodge, and it was a place they could stock up on supplies rather than make the long trip to Dodge or elsewhere to get the supplies. Now, this situation did not make the Plains tribes very happy. It infuriated them. Life on the reservations, for those that were living on the reservations at the time, was not good. And the Adobe Walls camp violated the terms of the Medicine Lodge Treaty. Now, there was this young Comanche prophet named Issa Tate. And he called for the people to gather for a Sundance, where he called for vengeance. He claimed that they would be invulnerable to the bullets of the intruders. And Quanah Parker and hundreds of others answered the call. As just before dawn or near dawn, and unfortunately for the Plains tribes, their plan didn't really work that good because most of the hunters had been awakened to try to repair a ridgepole in Hanaran Saloon that supported the sod roof. And it was then when they were already up that the Comanches, Kiowas, and Cheyennes, led by Quanah Parker and his attack, attacked. Now, there were about 28 men at the site. Among them were Bat Masterson and a man named Billy Dixon. And there was one woman, Hannah Olds, who worked it there as a cook. They were all there together in the camp. And when the attack began, they sought protection in the cover of Jim Hanoran's saloon, 
the Myers and Leonard store and in Wright's store. They lost two men in the first attack, and the fighting was pretty close and hard going. And the men that died, though, were two unfortunate Teamster brothers that had been sleeping outside in their wagon. The attackers also killed a Newfoundland dog. All three were scalped. The charges continued till about noon, and another defender died in this fighting. And there was a fourth defender, reportedly, who accidentally killed himself by the discharge of his own gun. Repulsed by the defenders, the attackers then set siege for about four or five days. They didn't launch any more attacks, but set siege, and it must have been a very grim, intense period of time. Things hadn't gone quite as Isate had predicted, to say the least. And then, on the second day, it's when Willie Dixon made his famous shot. And what had happened is, a group of about 15 to 20 Cheyennes had appeared on a high mesa overlooking the post. And from a distance of about seven-eighths of a mile, Dixon fired. And he shot one of the warriors off his horse with his sharps rifle. The man hit the ground before the sound of the shot could reach the group. Even Dixon must have been amazed at this. Over these days, word spread and other buffalo hunters came to the rescue. And by the fifth day, when the Plains attackers withdrew from the fight, there were more than 100 defenders at Adobe Walls. The warriors had lost about 30 men, not being invulnerable to the bullets. Quanah himself had been wounded in the fighting and Isate had his horse shot out from under him. After the Plains Warriors withdrew, the defenders decorated the corral with 12 warriors' heads. And it wasn't long after the Second Battle of Adobe Walls that the United States military launched the Red River War of 1874 to 1875 which led to the Plains tribes settling on the reservations near Fort Sill in Indian Territory. If you want to get caught up on a little bit of that, I've covered some of the significant things in it in some earlier uh, Daily Dose episodes, so if you want to go back and check them out. So that's going to do it for this occasional Daily Dose of Texas History. We'll be back soon. A lot of cool projects are in the works, in addition to our normal lessons and plans on doing more of these little mini episodes. It's just a busy time of the year for me. Thanks for listening. Thanks for everybody that supports me with Patreon and through buying me a cup of coffee. There's links in the show notes. It is appreciated. I am still thinking about doing some episodes on just some of the cool books that I've been able to find and some recommendations along those lines. And as usual, the theme music is by the great Derek McClendon. Thanks again to him. Please go check out his music. I swear, if you were to take the time and actually listen, and you can pick any three songs, it doesn't matter to me, because I guarantee you, most of you that really care about music, if you were to sit and take the time and listen closely to any three songs on any of his releases, you'll probably end up wanting to listen to all of them. I stand by my word that he's that good. Uh, but today we're going to end the episode with a song by another artist, Kate Anson. And this song is Pawn Shop Past Palestine. It's one of my favorites that he's, he's done. And so thanks for listening. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Be kind. Adios. Shaw past Palestine had a 38 revolver and an empty old billfold. I once promised her everything. Hell, I never knew how far I'd let it go. There's no peace left in these pines. There's no oil left within the grounds below. With the wheels running dry 
I'm scared my baby's patience is running kind of low. So I shot a man in Palestine for some petty cash and a diamond ring. While my baby likes the finer things, and lately she's been dreaming for some gold. So if this don't go as planned, they'll have to lock me up in Huntsville down the road. Shot past Palestine, had a 38 revolver, two bullets missing from the roll. I once promised her a wedding ring, but work around here's been moving sort of slow. While I've always been a praying man, I've never been the one to let things go. I've always been an honest man I've lately I'm just running out of room So I shot a man in Palestine For some petty cash and a diamond ring well, My baby likes the finer things And lately she's been dreaming for some gold so she won't take my hand Well I got nowhere else to turn and go With a pawn shop past Palestine had a 38 revolver and I told her 